now we move on to our discussants um, that were so kind to look at our work. First is Andrew Shipilov from INSAD, and he will give us comments on High Dunes and Christopher's paper. Andrew, please take the virtual floor. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Hello, can you? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can you see my screen with the with the presentation? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Very good. So uh, I had two papers to discuss, and to one of them was was a presentation. Unfortunately, I didn't get to get to see the full paper. So uh, forgive me for necessary incompleteness. It's it's more difficult to comment on the presentation than on the paper. But let me start with that uh, nonetheless. And um, I think this is really good to collect feedback for your study at this stage while you're sort of in the stage of transition from, from, from the presentation to, to, to a manuscript. And uh, when I was reading it, um, to me, the, in, the first big question was, why would you focus on a merger? So what is, what is a merger in your context? Um, it seems to me that what you're studying here is a simple story. That is, if there is more internal competition, the more people will leave from an organization. So can, could we have hypothesized the same thing uh, without the merger? And uh, you seem to be saying in the presentation that merger attenuates the internal competition. But what I would really like to know is what is the baseline from which it attenuates that internal competition? And uh, I mean, I, I would have really liked to see some asymmetry uh, in, in, your, uh, in your theorizing and also in your analysis. And I've seen that some of the folks in the, in the chat were also talking about sort of who is, who is acquiring who and do you have more dominant party in the transaction or not? And one of the answers was, well, this is a merger. This is not an acquisition. Uh, but still, I wonder if you can exploit that because otherwise, again, so why are we looking at this specific context? Why not look simply at a stable organization, the stable sort of situation? And would you not observe the same thing, meaning that the more people you have competing in the same knowledge domain as you are, you would be more likely to leave. So if you cannot find the dominant partner, then, you know, this comment is probably going to be mute. Uh, but still, uh, the critical question would be, what do we get from, from the merger context um, in, this, in this paper? So when I was reading your hypothesis too, um, I was wondering whether there is uh, some space for a U-shaped relationship there. Because essentially, you're, you're, um, and I'm thinking about a business school, for example, if we had some kind of a weird case, we don't even have to again go to a merger, one business school acquiring the other. But even in the steady state, so, so one could think that the more competition around a particular professor there is, the more this professor is likely to live in the sense that, I don't know, if everybody around me studies networks and, uh, you know, there's competition for network dom dominance in a particular school, I may be more likely to eat. But that misses an important part that I may also care about the community of knowledge in my, in my uh, organization. And I don't know to what extent this is true in a law firm, uh, but I think that as human beings, as professionals, we do care about the community. So if, there, if I'm the only person in that, uh, in that legal practice, in that specialty in the law firm, even though my competition is zero, I may feel lonely and maybe I will go to the law firm there. In fact, there are people, there are some people who have the same uh, domain expertise that I can go and ask advice from. So what does that all mean? Uh, well, that means that maybe there is a U-shaped relationship for age two. Uh, where you would have two forces. Um, so internal competition, so clearly, as you say, there may be negative impact on future departures, uh, but then maybe there's also a need to have the community of practice around the lawyers, and that maybe there would be some positive impact of future uh, departures, increases with increase in the past departures from the lawyers' practice area. 
And uh, if, if you think that this sort of argument for the, um, uh, for the community effect uh, is irrelevant for the theorizing, then I would say at the very least you would need to test for the nonlinearity uh, as a post hoc analysis uh, once sort of once you've done all the main ones, because this tension between uh, being lonely versus competing against colleagues with similar knowledge, that strikes me as, as something that at least some of the reviewers uh, may, ra may raise when you are uh, going forward with this paper. Um, another thing which I'm pretty certain reviewers would raise, and I think some maybe Asim and others have also raised this uh, issue in the comments, is um, are departures voluntary or not? And uh, at the very least, reviewers may ask that. And uh, you know, your line of defense to this question could be, does it, does it matter for your story? So um, if you do not have any asymmetry in the power, in your, uh, in your theory and in your context, maybe it doesn't matter where the departures are voluntary or not. But if there is some asymmetry between players, um, you know, maybe the one party is more dominant than the other because this is an acquisition um, and sort of less of a merger, then uh, you would probably likely to see more involuntary departures from the less dominant firm or from the target or from whoever has less power in the organization because people may be fired simply because someone else have, is imposing their will uh, on, on them. And at the very least, I think you would need to find out a clever way to control for the motivations of people to leave. And uh, at the very least, I would like to see a control for, you know, to some extent, if, if, you, if you would know where people are going, um, you know, can you, can you know about the salary differentials? Is there something that could tease out the voluntary versus non-voluntary departures that would be good, assuming, especially if there is some power uh, dynamic story in your, um, in your study? So these were theoretical issues that I was able to pick up from, from the presentation. There are some... Sorry. Just so you know, you have about three minutes left, a little bit more. Or for this paper? Nope, for both papers. For both papers. Oh my God. Okay. Then I will fast forward uh, to the uh, future research section. And since I'm a networks guy, I'm sort of worshiping the altars of uh, Moreno, uh, who shall survive. And uh, this is a great paper back out of the 30s, which said that people tend to live together. These were girls running from orphanages. But still, as a network scholar, I really like to know, are people leaving because they're friends? So could you have some control for social relationship between people who leave the organizations together? Now, in terms of the uh, paper on the human capital redeployment and spin-out performance, I did have the privilege to read the entire work. And I think essentially your, your work is very interesting because you're essentially trying to conceptualize and test a moderated mediation model that links uh, industry relatedness and ownership redeployment of uh, human resource and, um, and individual's performance. I'll tell you the big picture of the paper. I like you bringing all those different constructs together. But what I was missing is a theoretical framework set up up front as to why you include specific moderators and also mechanisms as opposed to the others. When I was reading the front end, when I was reading the theory, until I got to the specific hypothesis, it was totally unclear to me why are you bringing this specific combinations of mechanisms for one hypothesis or the other. And uh, you really need to have a very clear argumentation for your main effects. You want to have uh, maybe one, one or maximum two mechanisms that you have used to argue your main effects. And only then you would move to interactions because if you haven't clearly argued for the mechanisms translating the uh, independent variables to dependent variables as main effect, you wouldn't know how the interactions would work. What really sort of worried me is that you have the three-way interaction hypothesis there, which is not really argued. It's sort of stuck in the back of as, as an extra hypothesis. But these are tricky because three-way interactions essentially imply synergies of synergies of the mechanisms. And since you haven't offered me a clear argumentation for the main effects and two-way interactions, it's very difficult to think about what the three-way interaction would be like. 
um, it would help to simplify. So your first hypothesis is, is pretty clear and linear knowledge relatedness leads to uh, parent spin out redeployment. In your second hypothesis, uh, all of a sudden you're bringing the arguments about protection from expropriation from third parties. This was not uh, foreshadowed in the, in the beginning. I did not know what to expect, why those mechanisms are there. Why do firms care about third party expropriation? Do they even have any evidence that, that they care? Um, I liked a sentence in your argument for H3. So skills of management and founding teams are significantly related to performance in new ventures. This was just one argument. I hope she would develop a few paragraphs around it so that we know why parents spin out redeployment to performance would be, would be important. Then it became really complex for me um, the, you've, you've brought in the logic of fear of backward redeployment of uh, human resources from the spin out back to firm. That came out of the, I was, I was slightly confused as I was reading uh, H4. You were bringing absorptive capacity argument um, that a little bit also came out of the blue. Then you had an argument about internal labor markets and business groups, again, came out of the blue. So I was, as a reader, I was really uh, hoping that you would, in the beginning, set up a clear theoretical model. These are the mechanisms, these are line and lines and boxes we care about. And these would be the mechanisms for the main effects and we will look at their, uh, at their interactions. Um, my big challenge was empirical. Uh, and if you want, we can speak offline, but I don't think the 2SLS is the most appropriate framework there. Uh, it may not be the most appropriate one because essentially you have variables in the second stage, which should have been in the first stage uh, to begin with. Uh, and I can send you this slide that's going into a lot of details about your econometric specification, but um, uh, I don't think you need the, the two SLS here. So Stata has this very good command called SCM, so structural equation modeling. And then there is this link that you can click. It's gonna bring you to a website which tells you how to set up systematically moderated mediation models in Stata without the need for the instruments. And uh, I think you can use your two stages of potential setup, but given that you have interactions in stage one and stage two, you're probably better off with structural equation models than 2SLS. You just are risking uh, incurring a lot of reviewers' um, uh, unhappiness with this kind of empirical setup. Anyway, to Andrew? both, mm -hmm. I will send you my slides and I will uh, stop here. Perfect. Thank you very much, Andrew. So next up, we're, uh, we are honored to have Tim with us. Um, uh, Tim will discuss Hai Jun's, my own paper, and Christopher's paper. So Tim, if you could take the floor, thank you very much. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'll remind you about- Well, first of all, I, I, I have to say, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I have to say that uh, Samina and Heather and, and everybody, I think we're on to something here. I'm looking at the feedback the authors and the speakers are getting in the chat, and this is phenomenal. What, what great feedback. Um, secondly, I, 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 uh, Julia, I was under the impression I was supposed to do Arcadia's work and, <laughs> and not uh, Hyjun's, so I did not prepare for, uh, for that paper. So I apologize. Correct, my mistake, I, sorry. No, that I'm was correct. Mistake. But um, I, I, I was in the audience at one of the plenary sessions at SMS in Minneapolis, and one of the participants was Mike Roman, the CEO of, of 3M. Uh, he was an engaging speaker, and one of his comments really caught my attention. There's lots of research showing, he, he purports, that multi-business firms perform better when they're more active resource reallocators. I had a couple of immediate reactions to this statement. First, I was excited because it validated a research domain I've been exploring for well over a decade. Uh, the CEO of 3M is interested in resource redeployment. Um, a second reaction was one of surprise. Uh, I was surprised because I don't think we have a good understanding of the specific hypothesis he put forth. Does the degree of resource redeployment affect firm value? The study I've seen that most directly relates to this question is a 
simple McKin McKinsey quarterly article revealing through management surveys that dynamic reallocators have higher mean returns over a 20 year period than more passive reallocators. So how does the degree of resource redeployment affect firm value? In some sense, each of these papers is, is picking away at this question. So the Sakartoff and Ryer paper. Full disclosure here, I was chair of Arcady's dissertation at Purdue and, and we have several papers together and, and Jeff and I were colleagues and friends at, at Purdue. So I hope my comments aren't too off the mark. Uh, I've only seen a four page abstract of the work uh, prior to this talk and, and here is how I understand it. The work is pretty dense uh, and complex so it might be worthwhile to kind of uh, simplify it. <laughs> this is my simplification, let's see if it's right. So M&As offer the opportunity to redeploy resources from acquire to target and from target to acquire. This potential for redeployment creates flexibility that should be recognized in a priori valuations of a deal. Prior work has studied the factors driving the potential value and redeployability, but this work was general and not specific to M&As. In the context of M&As, it may be that factors driving up value through redeployability are endogenous to the factors that may drive down value by accentuating the lemons problem and integration problems. So they calculate a net effect of redeployability consisting of the theoretical potential minus agency and integration costs. So, so if my understanding is correct, I would emphasize that it's very worthwhile to acknowledge these M&A costs should bear upon redeployability. While they're certainly recognized in the M&A literature, their determinants have not been linked to the determinants of the switching option. And this is critical because if the drivers of redeployability are intertwined with the drivers of these hazards, they can't be treated independently they, and they have path dependent effects. Consequently, to value them appropriately, these hazards have to be embedded in a real options model. The bottom line is that this paper gives us a better sense for the true potential of value creation through redeployment. Moreover, the model by Arcady and Jeff gives us a template for exploring its con in contexts outside of M&A, how redeployability is intertwined with other hazards. One of the other things I like about this paper is that it's driving us towards practical use. With their help in potential M&As, we can better unpack which component of value creation is tied to redeployability versus leaving resources in place. So let me switch to the Bodner paper. Uh, first of all, uh, let's distinguish between redeployability and redeployment. Okay. So resource redeployability is, is flexibility, which can be characterized as a switching option. Julia is interested in redeployment, which is the exercise of a switching option. So what factors influence when redeployment should occur? The literature suggests three, uh, redeployment costs, inducements, and external transaction costs. And her paper builds upon this theory in several ways. So first, she suggests that we should not view inducements narrowly. They should not be confined to re return correlation or performance differences or volatility. Firms should also consider that inducements might be characterized by the potential for lower communication or coordination costs, or more effective knowledge transfer, or improved understanding of organizational identity. These are real inducements. I wanna emphasize that this is a novel contribution and very interesting. In some sense, we can broaden this argument to suggest that redeployment might help to create a dynamic capability for future redeployment. A second contribution 
is that is that the nature of redeployment affects is that the nature of redeployment affects in the inducements that are in play so prior literature focuses on only on redeployment between subsidiaries but julia suggests redeploying from parent to subsidiary affects a different set of inducements and redeploying from subsidiary to parent affects other inducements. This is an interesting hypothesis and I'd like to push Julia to provide more clarity around these relationships and why certain inducements are constrained to certain forms of redeployment. I don't completely understand why redeploying from parent to subsidiary affects communication costs, but a redeployment in the opposite direction does not. On the empirics, uh, one of the challenges is adequately controlling for the inducements that are known in the literature. If you're trying to assess whether it's important to consider alternative measures of inducements, we should be sure to control for the traditional measures. And because your analysis is at the firm level, differences across subsidiaries is aggregated, making it difficult to control for return correlation or performance differences or volatility that are more accurately reflected at the segment level. So I must admit I'm a bit concerned also um, that your effects may not constitute redeployment effects. This is partly because you're using an indirect measure to proxy for your various inducements. It's also partly because I believe to capture the flexibility effect, you may need to interact your, your main variables with volatility, the key driver of the value of the switching option. Finally, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that your redeployment between subsidiaries is essentially a replication of prior work. It might be important, an important starting point to discuss the extent to which your work effectively replicates the few studies of this phenomenon. Obviously, the extent to which you have different measures affects replica, re, replicability. So um, let me move to the Sable and Sasson paper. Uh, so Chris and Amir. Um, this paper studies redeployment from established firms to their spinouts. I love the fact that you're studying redeployment in the context of entrepreneurship and innovation. This in itself is novel, interesting and important. Spinouts are one way firms explore. So there tends to be a lot of uncertainty around their eventual success. As we know, uncertainty drives the desire for flexibility. Because of this uncertainty, it might be hard for spinouts to hire employees, employees who are unwilling to commit to the, in the midst of employment risk. A cheaper alternative might be internal redeployment. The authors argue that human capital redeployment is more likely with greater relatedness. They seem ambivalent about whether this relationship is due to lower switching costs or greater inducements because knowledge can be more useful in related spin out If you know this literature, the relatedness hypothesis is no surprise. What is surprising, however, is the focus on ownership. That is fascinating. Prior research in redeployment has assumed complete ownership of subsidiaries, but that's not the case here. Anything less than complete ownership might confound the ability to redeploy because managers in the established firm do not have full discretion. This is, this is great. Uh, this reminds me of a criticism I've received of my own empirical work with Timo Sol in the retail industry, where there, there tends to be a lot of franchising in retail. The critics argued that surely companies have less ability to redeploy franchise stores than company-owned stores. Your treatment of ownership is better than, than that of Timo's and, and mine, but, but I would encourage you to take it a step further. There's a difference between ownership and control, and you're assuming that the two are the same. A growing body of work, mostly in finance, has proved that assumption to be tenuous. So a few uh, comments on the empirics. 
it seems that there was redeployment in only about 4.4% of cases. This is very useful and interesting information. And I would encourage you to present more descriptive statistics like this. We really need to know how often our, employ our employees redeploy to spinouts. What, what is the distribution? Can you do some univariate analysis to see whether redeployment is higher for more relatedness? Our, our field is certainly heading in, the, in this direction of, of more descriptive statistics because it, it really helps the reader gain comfort in the data provi before providing a multivariate model. Uh, a second point, I suppose the likelihood of spin out might be affected by the potential to redeploy. So this suggests a three-stage model might be appropriate. <laughs> You might consider adding control variables related to inducements. Uh, you seem to have relatedness controls for switching costs, but, but there might be some, some added value to, to additional controls. I would encourage you to run a single stage performance model with the intent to replicate prior research, because this is other, how other people have studied it in the past. Once you've re replicated their results, you want to show how your theory and model change the outcome. This will give us a better sense for whether your theory is an improvement, and if you have successfully replicated, we'll have more confidence that your empirical approach is reasonable. In other words, we can then conclude that the results should not be driven by your data and measurement, so we can be more confident that it's driven by the theoretical mechanism you espouse. Very interesting contribution. So in, in closing, uh, I think each of these papers drives us towards a better understanding of how resource allocation and reallocation contributes to firm value. Theoretical models like the type uh, Arkady and Jeff presented help us better understand complex interactions and, and enable us to, to go well beyond intuitive argumentation. The efforts of, of Julia, Chris, and Amir draw our attention to factors influencing redeployment that have not been previously elaborated. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim, for really, really helpful comments. Thank you. Now we are on to uh, our last discussant for this symposium, Will Mitchell, uh, who will comment on Arkady's Hydeans and my presentation. Cool. So let me quickly do a, a voice check. Um, Julia, can you hear me? And uh, anybody yes. else, if you can hear me, stick your hand up or, or, or use yes. your, green, your green dot, yes dot, to make sure that the, the voice is coming through. I'm gonna, I, I, we will assume you can hear me. Um, thanks. I'm just gonna talk. Um, I've you know, prepared notes around the three papers I'm gonna talk about, but I'm just gonna, rather than spending the time on posting the slides and forcing us to read them, I'm gonna talk it through. So let me start, Arkady and Jeff, let me start with your paper. On, on redeployment and acquisitions. And you know, you've built a model um, that says that looks through, takes into account valuation challenges and integration challenges. Uh, you think in terms of relatedness, and you essentially have a result from the model that says economies of scope uh, have greater benefits than either economies of scale or unrelated economies. And that's not particularly new, but it, it sort of gives us some, some confidence in the model. And then you talk about beyond relatedness. Uh, some benefits from volatility returns um, and some constraints from correlation and returns um, because you want to have some, uh, some scope for, for, for variation. Um, and then you work on some contingencies, valuation and integration challenges. Uh, and when the valuation challenges are high, uh, we get a non-monotonic impact uh, from current returns that are symmetric. And when integration challenges are high, we get a monotonic impact of current returns. Uh, so that's cool, but this not not exactly a, this is not exactly a but, but it's an important point. Models may be intrinsically interesting and elegant, but they're not particularly useful by themselves. Um, they're not particularly useful for, for either theory or empirics, frankly. And they're not particularly for, useful for empirics because they abstract away so much, and they're not particularly use, useful for theory because they they tend to be so focused that, that there's not clear what they say theoretically. The value of models is what we draw from them. And, and here, so, so I, here I do have a criticism about the, 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 the abstract I received. 
uh, which had a bunch of cool pictures and had one paragraph with all the results buried in a single paragraph. And this kind of reinforces the, the points that, uh, that Tim made. Um, so there's clearly something there. And, and Tim did a nice job of teasing out for us what's there. So I won't repeat that. But I'm going to push you on this. And you're both faculty, so you, you, should, be, you should be getting this at this point. It's the job of us, as each of us as an author, to tell the reader what's there rather than force the reader to figure out what's there. Um, partly that's just, you know, clear, partly that's just being fair to the reader. And it's partly because if you force the reader to figure out what's there, they're probably gonna find something that you aren't interested, interested in. So I'm gonna push you really hard as you move this work forward. And I realize this is going from an abstract to a paper and in a paper and all you do this. And, and Arkady, um, you, you certainly did part of this in the presentation. Uh, but it's a job for each of us when we're presenting any material, whether it's an abstract or a paper or a presentation, to be really clear about what's there. And, and I love the pictures. And, and I know there's the, the notion that, that a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, but I am going to say that a person, I don't know if a picture requires a thousand words to make it clear, but it does require at least 100 to 250 words to make clear what's there. Um, otherwise, it's just some cool colors and, and it may help us relax, uh, but it's not going to tell us what's there. So core ideas are, are cool. And, and the potential for, for drawing out implications sort of beyond the base, our base understanding uh, of redeployment in acquisitions is, is definitely there. And, and where I'm gonna push you is to pick one or two spots in the midst of that paragraph, and Arcadia, again, you got part of the way there with the presentation, and really, pu and, and really, really push hard on them um, rather, than settle, rather than stop with some, some lovely pictures. So again, um, great start for the work. And, and lots of opportunities to, to push it for, for, for forward. Um, second paper, uh, Hyejun Forrest, Rhett, Len, uh, your work on professional service firms, law firms, and, and post-acquisition ex exits. Um, so a couple things I took away from this. Uh, one is acquisitions of law firms are common. Um, just that empirical fact actually is really interesting and important. Um, second is that turnover of, of, the, of lawyers after, the acquisition, after acquisitions is common. Again, a really important point. Now, I do want to push you on one point here. Um, you largely assume that when we see turnover, this is disruptive. And you know, this is a general point really about all acquisitions, whether it's professional service firms acquisitions or, or any acquisition. We sometimes assume that when, when people leave, that's a bad thing for the acquiring firm. Um, the truth actually is that in many cases, the acquiring firm wants people to leave. Not only wants them to leave, but tells them to leave. So the challenge with acquisitions is not to keep everybody but it's to keep the people you want. Um, and frankly, I'll be blunt, um, encourage, tell the people you don't need to leave. And this is nothing saying anything about the quality of the people. They're often really good people, both in terms of their, their, themselves as individuals and their skills. Um, but part of acquisitions is, is moving people around. And you know, I, I've done some work with folks from Cisco who are really, really active in acquisitions. And they go into every deal with a really clear sense of who they wanna keep and who they don't wanna keep. And this is gonna be true for law firms as well. So you've got three predictions, and one I'm gonna call a static competition prediction and two a dynamic, two, two dynamic predictions. The static one is basically just more competition, more exits. The dynamics are the more exits um, of peers, the fewer exits, and then there's a prediction around M&A overlap. Um, and those are, those, I think those are a useful start. Um, You've got some empirical, uh, where the internal competition is based on overlapping practice areas, which, you know, which is a nice start. Uh, but I guess I do want to push you on an alternative logic. And that, again, builds on the notion that exit might actually be desired by the acquiring firm uh, as a way of reducing duplication. And so the key resource is less the technical area in the practice, in the practice area. And this is, this is, this is for, for, for law firms in particular. Um, it's less the technical knowledge of the lawyers in the practice area because there's lots of technical knowledge. Um, there's lots of lawyers that have, that have graduated from the same schools and you know have the same uh, understand the same technical area, and it's much more the client relationships in the area. Um, and and I realize that's really hard to get at empirically, but at least logically you've got to think it through. Um, and so I guess I would have an alternative hypothesis that I would at least think about logically which is that exits may well be partners with duplicated technical knowledge in the practice, yet weaker client relationships. And to the extent, at least think about that logically and then see whether you can work that into the empirics in any way. 
um, I think it would be a more robust study. Um, it's a great start, um, and don't get me wrong, I really like it. Um, there's just an opportunity to push it forward, forward even, even farther. Um, third paper, Julia, your paper. Um, thanks again for presenting it. Um, second time I've seen it this week. Uh, Julie presented a uh, piece of this work at the, the, the CCC uh, conference over the weekend. It's great to see it both times uh, and see it develop. Um, I love the notion of redeployment, uh, you know, he, he, employee redeployment among firms, you know, within firms, parent to subsidiary, subsidiary to firm, parent, um, sub to sub. Um, you know, I like the development of the, the, the mechanisms, the cost of control, coordination benefit needs, specialization versus generalization. Um, I do a nice job of building on the redeployment literature. I want to put in a plug for the Karim and Capron work from 2016, which I think is really a wonderful summary of, of the re re redeployment literature to date. Um, I guess, Julie, one thing I'd encourage you to do, you cite a fair bit of Charlie Williams's work. Um, it'd be worth looking at Char one of Char Charlie's first papers in this space, a paper published in Management Science on the performance effects of redeployment within firms. And I know you're not looking at performance, you're looking at activity, which is great. Uh, but it'd be worth, but there's some logic in that work of, of Charlie's that actually can help you think, thinking through um, your hypothesis development. Um, hypotheses, H1, uh, you know, related diversification needs more from parent to sub uh, because of uh, control, you know, with the mechanism is, is the desire for control. Um, H2, sub to sub, uh, all diversification uh, because of some combination of, of of coordination and control, um, and H3, um, as related diversification, related diversification goes up, uh, sub to parent goes down. And, and this one, we talked a little bit about this last week, and I'm going to push you again on it here. Um, I'm not 100% sure about H3. Um, it's, it's relying on um, a basically a fewer benefits for, from le for leverage because of unrelated diversification. And if you've got lots of subs with different different skill bases, you get less opportunities for leverage. Therefore, you don't need, need to move people around. Um, it's at least working through logically the situ whether whether firms, at least in some cases, would want to move uh, people from sub to parent when they have unrelated diversification, um, in order to get greater understanding that they need for control at the parent level. And so, since you've got the mechanisms of control and coordination, uh, it's worth thinking about what role both of those play, not just, not just coordination, but also control um, in the, the sub to parent relationship that you have in H3. Um, and I know your results support this, the hypothesis, but I'm actually more, I personally am more interested in the logic than I am in the hypothesis, than, than in the results. Because it's the, the logic that really helps us understand what's going on. Because any, anything can drive results. Um, uh, just a quick show of hands. How many of us have run models that have an infinite number of results in them? And had to figure out which which results had the mo the strongest logical base. I'm going to put my hand up. I'm, I'm going to put a green a green dot on there. Um, so if the logic ain't right, or if the logic ain't convincing, um, neither are the results. Um, some qu so um, so I guess the last point I would make, and then I'll pass turn this over to to general conversation, is um, it might be worth because you've got this mix of coordination control and because firms have to take both into account if they're going to operate well. And you use the example of Tata in, in the paper. Um, Tata has both those needs uh, for coordination and control, especially as it moves across the world. Um, and it, Tata has 120 subs or something like that. Um, and it can't let them all run independently, of, completely independently of each other. Um, because as they try to develop the Tata brand and the Tata position across the world, the corporate position, um, they actually need some control as well as as well as leveraging. Um, so it might be worth looking at some joint patterns, where one type of re redeployment might complement or substitute for for the other, or where there's combinations, different combinations of needs for coordination and control um, that might shape your results. Um, so again, um, this paper, as in the other two I looked at, I love the, I, I love I love where you are now. Um, and um, I love just as much um, where, you, where you have the opportunity to go. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to read the three papers and, and to, uh, to listen to, to the presentations today. Thank you so much. Thank you to all, to all the discussants, to the presenters again as well, but to the discussants especially, this was really helpful. And I see lots and lots of comments in the chat. I just want to say, because time is a bit tight, um, 
before we get to the questions, we thought it would be great if we could continue chatting a bit uh, like we do at AOM when we continue talking during the breaks. Our presenters can all still hang out. So if you still have questions, I see a lot uh, of reactions in the chat room, so in the chat box. So if you can stay, the presenters will remain for a bit and then we can direct more questions to each if that's, uh, if you can, if you have time. Um, I'll direct a f some first questions to, to Arkadi. Saw a lot of reaction from Anita McGeehan. Um, Anita, maybe you, you want to unmute yourself and actually clarify, because I see a lot of um, comments sure, that you have. Sure. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much. Three great discussants and wonderful papers, and it's so great to see you all. You look terrific, and, and I'm thrilled to be part of this. Thank you, Samina and team. So uh, for Arkady, I, I had, you'll see in the chat, I had written a number of comments that very much reflect the, the discussant's uh, advice and, and, and considerations. But uh, one thing that um, might be uh, particularly interesting to the group is, um, I, you know, I, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit or uh, offer some insights on how this equation, the central equation that's in your model relates to uh, the constructs that you had put at the uh, beginning of your of your uh, at, at beginning of your study on types of resources. I'm you know that I want to make sure I'm remembering exactly what you said those types of resources are. But can you can, uh, inducements and obstacles from Penrose? Can you can you align the model in words for us now with inducement and obstacles, and then talk about how both the model and the inducements and obstacles distinction relates to industry and non-industry redeployment. That might help us understand a little bit what exactly uh, those pictures mean and your findings uh, describe. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Anita. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to refer uh, for, for a careful reading of this, uh, of this topic to our paper with team. Uh, this, uh, the, question, uh, the question about how uh, the equation uh, parameters relate to the uh, broader conceptual discussion of inducements and obstacles in Penrose. We, we tried to elaborate upon that carefully in 2015 article published at SMG. Well, but briefly, uh, obstacles uh, emerge from uh, unrelatedness uh, when um, uh, the target and the acquirer or in our work with team business I and business J within the same firm have uh, relatively dissimilar requirements to resources. Uh, in, in the language of Ramel's definition uh, of relatedness, they are unrelated. It is more costly to adjust resources uh, previously used in business I to start using them in business J. So this is uh, exactly how it is operationalized in the equation. The more unrelated businesses I and J uh, the uh, greater is the loss in efficiency, as Werner Feld and, uh, and, uh, and Montgomery defined that in their 1988 article, in redeploying resources from one business to another. Or Katie, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. I, um, I, I wanted just to, just to ask you, though, how, what is the logic for the redeployment if they're so unrelated? In other words, I, when I read Penrose, when I read Penrose, I thought that what they were, what Penrose was pointing to was that you have this overwhelming logic for resource recombination, then then there are challenges in the execution that are important and that may reflect the kind of diversity you've just described. But I guess I'm, what I'm asking for is just a, a sort of um, understanding of how industry and non-industry uh, redeployment why are those things different constructs than the constructs of obstacles um, and, uh, you know, um, and so on? So just help me understand why the separation between the condition and the, and the effect. Well, this is, this is actually the separation which uh, Edith Penrose introduced in her book and uh, reiterated in the uh, separate article on how redeployment happened at the Hercules Powder Company. Obstacles is what uh, precludes redeployment, what makes it more difficult, but this is not the only determinant of those instances. There is an opportunity cost 
of continuing to use resources in a business which performs worse than an alternative where the same resources okay. can be used regardless of whether that alternative is related or not. So Penrose highlighted the interplay between inducements and obstacles. We believe uh, in our paper with STEAM in 2015, we believe that that interplays, interplay between inducements and obstacles went a little bit unnoticed in, in Penrose's work. So we wanted to re-emphasize that in our 2015 article by saying, you know, relatedness is very important, but our article is named Getting Beyond Relatedness. Yeah. It performs much better than I. Maybe even high cost of redeploying from I to J will not preclude the redeployment because J performs so much better than I. So the, uh, the consideration of them together, the, what, uh, how costly is that to redeploy, which is obstacles, and how attractive the redeployment is intrinsically, which is inducement when J performs much better. It is important to consider them together. This is why we name our article Getting Beyond Relatedness, another article 2015 at SMG. Yeah. So, but okay. this idea, which is, uh, it, it is repeatedly mentioned in Penrose. It was probably not stated explicitly enough to be appreciated and noticed up to the extent uh, to which we believe it deserves. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you both very much. Oh. Maybe a question directed to Haidun that Dimo Ringoff brought up, whether you would think that the effects differ for target versus acquire workers and whether you're able to distinguish between exit by target versus acquire knowledge workers. Is Haidun still here? So, you were asking the any um, effect between target and acquiring acquiring and acquired uh, form right yeah i think um it could be possible so maybe we can um think about how um prior access from labor uh, from the the target firms and acquiring firms can um, have different influences or the competition effect also can be different. So we are working on uh, looking at those differences as well. So that would be good um, add to our paper in, in order to develop it, so. Nice, okay. Um, I see that uh, Aldona had a uh, raised hand. Aldona, do you want to mute yourself, uh, to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, so I had a very quick question uh, to Christopher. So first of all, great to see this paper that developed in the past few years. Um, I was wondering whether you thought about actually splitting this into a couple of papers because like Andrew, I had a hard time following the moderation effects and understanding the logic why you're bringing them up. And I was wondering whether you would be better off with two papers. Uh, thank you for the comment, Aldona. We have actually thought about it. Um, given that there is a lot going on for only one paper, um, so far one, one effort in this is actually to look at whether relatedness drives a specific type of redeployment. So whether more specifically trained workers, because we also have job categories and education categories. So we know what the people are actually doing in the firms or what their structural position is and what they have been trained to do. If for example, relatedness would drive more workers with a general education or with more specific education and whether there is a discrepancy. This was one thought to actually make this more homogeneous and then in a second paper, focus more on the performance, one behavioral paper, one performance paper. So yeah, in short. Okay, are there any other raised hands? Anyone that wants to make comments that maybe are not in the uh, chat box? Because um, the chat box comments, we can share them and parse them out later to, to each of the authors. If you have a comment that wasn't shared there. I see a raised hand by Abu Rehan. Did you want to make a comment? Agnes? Agnes, yeah. I see. Okay. 
everybody hears me? Okay, uh, my comment is actually for you, Yuria, and builds a little bit on Zamina's comment, which is uh, how firms diversify, whether that affects how you would uh, redeploy. And there, the idea is also whether, because now you are not controlling for access of employees. So let's say a firm redeploys via acquisition, and we see a lot of access employees exiting with the acquisition, thus we would probably assume that there is higher need for redeploying some of them. So there might be at least to control for exit of employees in the receiving unit or also, I guess, because you have the data. So at the moment, I guess you control for the total number of employees within the unit. Um, so looking at also who, like what's the turnover in the, the receiving firm might be uh, another thing. So just to clarify, you would control for both people exiting any of the units and people joining the unit, right? Uh, yeah, I guess because you have, so ultimately I would rather have it on the subsidiary level, but because you have the analysis on the firm level and not on the subsidiary level, so first probably I would weight it by subsidiary size because mm -hmm. I guess the, the Finnish data is pretty similar to the Danish data and then we see a lot of differences in so both the, the age of the subsidiaries but also the size of the subsidiaries. So weighting it by that might already help and then see okay if in the year there is a particular high a spike in exits maybe there's uh, something going on and I guess you also have the data for the acquisitions. Okay, nice, thank you. There was a comment for Hygium by Elena Vidal. Elena, did you want to elaborate further? The question was about, is it scale or scope as well? Yeah, I think my, my comment was about, uh, because in law firms, uh, you know, it, one of the arguments that she made was that, that Hygium made was that um, they're expanding and merging in order to increase scale, but because law firms also work, uh, you know, they practice different types of law, it might not necessarily be just scale, but also uh, the different scope in the different areas of law. So we may be seeing changes in, um, in, 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 in the composition of the partners because of the strengthening or weakening of the different departments that they have. So it might be an opportunity to explore if you have access to that data, to see not just the, the impact of scale, but also the impact that scope may have um, on this mobility. Yeah, thank you for your comments. And I think that's really a uh, good add to our models. And I uh, totally agree with you that maybe firms may be concentrated in certain expertise area, but also some other firms are um, trying to expand the, the legal expertise so that variance can have some influence in our theory and story. Thank you very much. Anyone else have uh, questions that they want to raise uh, over the microphone to any of our authors or comments? Hi, this is, this is Anita. Go ahead, and I just wanted to ask a little bit about the format that we have here of doing these uh, symposia. Sim can one of the leaders of the division just say a word or two about future opportunities to engage like this? Sure, thanks, Anita. Um, you know, when, when we found out that AOM was going to be virtual and because of its nature in a crunched period of time, we're offering during the conference only 10% of the content as synchronous and real time, we thought we, you know, we have a lot more flexibility if we go beyond the dates of just the annual conference. Perfect. And then we can also um, adjust for different time zones and for actually the presenters, they need to be there, right? Um, and so we thought, let's have more of these symposia. We're gonna have a few PDWs hopefully next month um, where we try to work outside the constraints of just the annual conference to keep our membership active. And one of the things, Anita, you've given me a moment to give a plug for is this coming, this month, we have something called Coffee Wishes, 
So for all junior faculty, so PhD students, assistant professors, postdocs, and even associates should apply. If you want to speak to a senior faculty member about your research or just advice about your career, it's a great way to get to know someone um, and get advice. So on our division page, you can look at our feedback, um, or, or sorry, all of the different uh, things that we're doing, but that's called Coffee Wishes. And you can talk to Anita McGann. She's on that list. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I just want to emphasize that another reason for doing these um, was that we thought, well, during this COVID crisis, people, you know, they need intellectual stimulation and, and it might help draw us together as a community. And, uh, and so even before we had the outcome of what AOM was doing, we were kind of brainstorming about, about this. And Samina has really done a fabulous job leading and Heather's done a lot of legwork uh, in putting this together so it's it's been great i mean i think these are, are fabulous innovations that we should continue to have even after the restrictions are lifted agreed and we don't have to travel and we can be in our pajamas from the waist <laughs> down i mean i i think it's great to be in person too there's value to that but i could see a model where we do this this way every other year i don't know um i don't know We'll have to see how the main conference goes, but anyway. Right, right, right. right. The wonderful thing really for, for presenters is to have access to all the comments as we're speaking, have an insight directly into what, you're, what the audience is thinking as we speak. It's very, very valuable. So I agree with you. It just reminds me that we will look at the chat and parse it and give the uh, we'll give it to Julia, who can then distribute to the different authors the comments that you've received on the chat box. And feel free, I think, to follow up with different people who gave you those comments. So Julia, any final comments from you? No, I just want to thank everyone for joining this and, and you and Jao for organizing it, Heather for the wonderful idea, and all the discussants for joining in this new version, which was, uh, you know, more effortful in terms of all the emails that they would receive from me. I flooded them and the presenters as well. So thank you so much.